And it is good to see you guys. Um, in just a few weeks, on December 1st, we're going to dive into the season of Advent together, which will kick off uh, kind of a new cycle through the church calendar. And uh, our team has been working really hard the last few months to put together a resource that I'm really excited about. It's a book that uh, contains uh, weekly and daily uh, devotions that will walk us through the church calendar together from uh, Advent all the way through Pentecost. And it's kind of designed to be an introduction to the liturgical calendar and the various seasons, as well as a way for our whole church or whoever feels like they want to participate to uh, be part of the same Bible reading plan. And so uh, we'll have that for you in a couple weeks, and uh, it's off at the printers right now, and I'm so excited to share it with you. And uh, when we get to December, we'll kind of launch into a new teaching series then. Um, but for now, if it's okay with you, um, I'm still in somewhat of a season of aftershock um, as it relates to my time away. And uh, if you weren't here last week, um, I recently spent uh, three weeks um, in a time of uh, intense therapy and solitude to try to dig deep into my own soul and my own story and uh, see which places God might be wanting to do some work and uh, draw my attention to. And so last week, um, I shared a little bit about what that experience was like and some of the things that I've been processing ever since. And for this week and next week, if it's okay with you, I want to kind of continue lessons from the cabin, so to speak. And uh, some of the things that I learned, experienced, and uh, have been continuing to wrestle with in my weeks, ba in my weeks back. So is that cool? And uh, starting December, we'll dive into to something new. Um, I'll be honest, last week's sermon um, was an incredibly difficult one to bring. And uh, it's also incredibly difficult knowing it's now on the internet. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, you know, people have a naked picture that leaks online, and that's a big deal. That's kind of what this feels like to me, if I'm honest. And, uh, but I have been, um, first I'll, I'll say, I've probably never gotten as much uh, feedback or response from any sermon I've given in, in 21 years. And um, so first of all, I appreciate that. I thank you guys that have reached out with your prayers, with your thoughts, with your encouragements. Uh, some of you really expressed concern for me and my faith and my well-being, and I uh, appreciate that. Others of you, it seems that um, we kind of tapped into something somewhat universal when it comes to the experience of being disappointed with God, when it comes to the reality that oftentimes God feels more absent than present uh, throughout the course of our lives. And the truth is that so many of us just don't know how to talk about that. And so I'm hoping that the conversation we started last week will continue uh, to shape us and cultivate within us a community uh, where it's okay to be honest about those dry seasons, about those wilderness times where God seems distant and silent and maybe even not real. So that's all right, and we're going to keep going there. Um, while I was away, and kind of, again, the, the hope was to leave no stone unturned in terms of my own story and soul, and it, it meant asking some hard questions having to do with uh, my faith, my theology, my identity, uh, my vocation in my life. And I wasn't afraid uh, to ask those questions, as difficult as they were, um, and one of the questions that inevitably would come up in a season like that would have to do with this work that I do as a pastor. And uh, like I just said, 21 years of this work, uh, my entire adult life, I've given myself to teaching the Bible and making disciples and leading the church, and caring for souls. And uh, if I'm honest, this is a difficult vocation. It's one that takes a toll. It's one that is incredibly draining and demanding and hard to clock out of, and um, it's just hard. And some of you have lives like that as well. And so there was part of me that was in light of my struggle with depression and other things just going, 
is this work sustainable? And am I continued to be called to this? And I know last week, some of you, as I was sharing my story, were worried that I was resigning or, <laughs> or leaving the faith or something like that. And um, here's, here's what I'm, where I'm landing. Um, the first is I'm still a Christian. I'm still committed to Jesus. And even though there's parts of my faith and theology that are being deconstructed, um, I've learned to doubt my faith without doubting Jesus. And I don't put my trust in my own ideas about God or my own experiences or feelings about God, but in the person of God himself whose name is Jesus. And in him, I have complete and total confidence. Secondly, when it comes to being a pastor, there is nothing else I'd rather do, and nowhere else I'd rather do it, and no one else I'd rather do it with. That this church, this congregation, this community of leaders, this expression of Christ's family, um, it really is a dream come true. And throughout the difficult days of my journey and processing and all of that, um, this church and this work that I'm part of has been way more part of the solution than part of the problem. And I'm grateful for that. And so, uh, if it's cool with you, I'd like to keep being your pastor for a long time. <laughs> as long as you're okay following somebody who leads with a limp, then... We're gonna go. We're gonna go far together, even if we don't go fast. So, one of the ideas that was really central to my retreat experience was this really basic concept that almost sounds so obvious that you don't even need to state it. But for some reason, um, it's not that obvious, and it's this idea that our present is shaped by our past. Your present is shaped by your past. Who you are is formed by where you come from and by where you've been. There is a direct cause and effect relationship between your upbringing, your family of origin, your childhood, your lived experience, and the person that you are today. This is something that, again, sounds incredibly obvious, that, of course, where I've been has helped determine where I am today. But what I've found is that within my own life and journey and discipleship, that this really obvious fact hadn't actually been accepted or engaged. That my present is deeply shaped by my past. And... The most influential part of any of our pasts, by far, is our family of origin. When I say family of origin, I don't just mean your parents and your siblings, although it starts with them, but I'm talking about your extended family, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, going back three to four generations. We have both within the scriptures and within the scientific world evidence that we are shaped, our identity, our personality, our psychology is shaped by our family origin going back several generations. Pete Scazzaro uh, is a pastor on the East Coast in New York City, and he uh, has written extensively about emotionally healthy discipleship, emotionally healthy spirituality, emotionally healthy uh, churches. And he's been one of the guys who's been really helpful in terms of where I've been at this point in my journey. And he tells the story that several years ago there was a professor at Harvard who did a big study on the multi-generational transmission of trauma. And specifically she focused in on the experience of those who survived the Holocaust and then went on to have kids who had kids. And what she found is when she studied the survivors of the Holocaust, the symptoms of trauma that they carried within their body 
were not just found in the survivors themselves, but were also passed on to their kids and to their grandkids. Some of the emotional dysfunction that these third generation descendants of Holocaust survivors were experiencing, things like the inability to form intimate relationships, that they're out of touch with their own emotions, that they're engaged or addicted, of in, addicted to self-destructive behaviors. In third generation Holocaust survivors, all of this can be traced back to undealt with trauma from their grandparents that was passed on not just through family culture and environment, not just through nurture, but was actually passed on genetically. It's a crazy idea, but it's actually consistent with the way the Bible talks about the reality of what we might call generational sin. That the experiences of our parents and grandparents, great-grandparents, actually have a significant shaping power on who we are and our experience of life. And so when it comes to this conversation about our discipleship to Jesus, our being formed into the image of Christ, we aren't just bringing ourselves into this room. We are also bringing with us our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. In a very strange way that we're not even aware of, we're talking about things that happened for us living today as far back as the mid-1800s in our family tree that actually have a shaping power in our lives and have something to do with the journey that we find ourselves in in becoming human in the way of Jesus. Three or four generations back, and I won't say much about this other than think about the lived experience of people today who are of African American or Native American descent. And when we start to understand the complexities of generational sin and the shaping power of family origin and the, pass, the genetic passing on of trauma, then it helps us understand much better some of the issues that our brothers and sisters of African American and Native American heritage experience. So the power of our, sh our family of origin is far deeper than most of us realize. And so there was a significant part of my time away in the cabin, as I mentioned last week, that simply had to do with digging deep into my own story and trying to uncover some of the ways that my family of origin parents, siblings, grandparents, great-grandparents, ways that I wasn't even aware of, that their life, their influence, their trauma, their pain may be affecting me. Now, for some of you, this sounds like psychobabble and not the kind of thing that we're supposed to be talking about in church. And I understand that. Traditionally, the church actually hasn't done a very good job of acknowledging this reality. And so we're certainly not going to solve all of your problems today. I'm not a therapist, and I would be a bad one. I'm just going to try to expose your problems and get you in therapy. <laughs> Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and I want you to see something. If you have a Bible, it's really helpful to actually have it open this morning, because I want you to see something. Last week, I made some observations about Jesus' time in the wilderness. Um, this week, we're going to step back just a, a half chapter and talk about the experience the, that he had just before he went out into the wilderness. Um, and I want us to look at the unique way that the author of Luke's gospel organizes this spiritual biography of Jesus. Starting in verse 21 of Luke chapter 3, it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Okay, so we have this significant moment, and this is one of the key passages in my life, where we understand that the foundation of Jesus' life and ministry is this received identity. We live in a world, 
and as part of the human race with this idea or this false belief that identity is self-made, that we get to decide for ourselves who we're going to be. And what the biblical view offers us is this reminder and this reality that identity isn't something that we create, it's something that's given to us. Both, like I said, through family of origin, but ultimately what Jesus shows us is that this identity that's given by his father becomes the foundation of everything that would happen from here on out. His life, his ministry, his suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, the whole thing starts with this moment. Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't done anything yet. And so his father's announcement of love and affirmation isn't based on a really good report card. It's simply based on the love that the father has always had for the son. And Luke doesn't tell us much, but he says that there's this beautiful moment And the Father speaks, uh, heaven is opened. Father speaks love and affirmation. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, okay? Now here's the next thing that is so interesting to me. There's not even an editorial break here. There's not like a bold subtitle, you know? In the very next verse, verse 23, Luke tells us, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai. I'll stop there. If you have your Bible open, you can see that it goes on for another 10 or 12 verses. It traces back this family story all the way down to verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. Now here's what's interesting to me. In Luke's gospel, the author positions Jesus' baptism immediately before his genealogy. In Jesus' baptism... His heavenly Father affirms him. You are my son whom I love with you. I'm well pleased. And this imparted identity becomes the foundation of Jesus' life and ministry. And then literally in the very next verse, Joseph tells us that in addition to being the beloved son of God, Jesus is also the bastard son of Joseph. The son of Heli, the son of Mathahat, the son of Levi, and so on, all the way back to Adam, the guy who screwed it all up. (laughs) On one hand, Jesus' identity is given to him by his heavenly father. But on the other hand, he is still connected to this long family tree, this human story. And it's a messy one if you can look through some of the names. And the positioning of this genealogy immediately following the baptism story is fascinating. If you remember Matthew's gospel, he starts the whole story with the genealogy in chapter one and then gets to the baptism in chapter three. But Luke seems to be trying to communicate something else. It's almost like if he was trying to say that Jesus, this man who is loved, named, and affirmed by God, um, his identity is not based on where he came from. That his identity is not affected by his family of origin. That was his old self. That was the old man. That was the human part of him that no longer lives. But his identity is now that he is the beloved son of God. If that's what Luke wanted to communicate about the person of Jesus, then he should swap these stories around. 
And he should start with the genealogy. He should start with the messy family tree of Jesus, but then get to the baptism story where the father says, Jesus, that's not who you are. You are my son. Gosh, I wish that that's the way the story went. But it's almost like he's saying this, that this Jesus, this man named, loved, and affirmed by God is not unaffected and is not disconnected from his family of origin. Yes, he is the beloved son of God and he's the bastard son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matha, the son of Levi. See, just like all of us, Jesus has two fathers. He has two families. And both fathers and both families have a shaping influence on his life and identity and relationships. And so when I reflect on and teach the baptism story, and I really do believe this, it's that if the gospel is true, then Pete Kelly no longer lives, but Christ Jesus lives in me. I've been united with Christ, empowered by his spirit, adopted by his father. Jesus and I have now become one, which means however the father sees Jesus is how the father sees me. And whatever the Father thinks of Jesus is how the Father thinks of me. And whatever the Father declares to be true about Jesus, he now declares to be true about me. Therefore, it is theologically true to say, Pete Kelly, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. If the gospel's true, then we are included in the baptism of Christ and adopted into the family of God. And instead of trying to piece together an identity for ourselves, we are the recipients of a God given identity as the beloved and accepted. And that is good news. That is the truth. And Peter Charles Kelly is the son of Charles David Kelly, who's the son of Talbert Cooper Kelly. And Talbert Cooper Kelly was a real son of a (laughs) duck, (laughs) if you know what I mean. Or so I've heard, I've actually never met him. In the late 1940s, my grandpa, Talbert Kelly was living in Memphis, Tennessee. He was married, had five kids, and at some point decided he wanted to start over. So he left his wife, left his family, and moved to the other side of the country, to Los Angeles. He soon met a young Latvian refugee a girl who had fled Eastern Europe during World War II and come to Los Angeles as a teenager. And so in L.A., Talbert and the girl who would become my grandma, Elizabeth, started a new family in the early 50s. They had a daughter, Linda, my aunt, and they had a son, Charles, my dad. And Talbert stuck around for a few years, but when my dad was three years old, Talbert left, went back to Tennessee to rejoin his original family. So from there, my grandma went on to marry a series of losers, four different guys over the next 12 years, all of whom, in their own way, were dysfunctional, unhealthy, abusive, or alcoholics. Talbert was supposed to be paying child support the whole time, but he kept his address secret 
and never paid a dime. And my grandma at one point found herself abandoned and alone living in downtown L.A., an immigrant single mother of two young kids. And so she decided to reach back out to Talbert and see if there was any chance of him coming back. And they began speaking on the phone regularly for a few months. And finally, Talbert agreed to once again leave his family in Tennessee and to come back and rejoin his family in L.A. It turns out that while he was in Memphis for a while, he had already abandoned that original family, married a, th a third woman, stayed with her for a few years till they got divorced too. So Talbert left two wives and five kids in Tennessee, came back to L.A. to my grandma, who was raising my aunt and my dad. And the plan was that he was going to drive from Memphis to L.A., and he would arrive on a Monday. At this point, it's been 12 years. My dad is now 15. Really has no memories or recollection of his father at all. But my grandma tells him as a freshman in high school that your dad is coming back. We're going to be a family again. And so on the day before he set out for L.A., it's March of 1970, Talbert calls the house. And my dad answered the phone. He says, Chuck, this is your dad. It's the first conversation they've ever had. And they talk for a while. Talbert confirms that he'll be there in just a few days and that soon the family will be back together again. And my dad tells him about his life, and about school and sports and friends and all that stuff. My dad goes to school the next day, so excited, telling all of his friends, my dad's coming back. Our family's going to be together again. But Talbert never came home. And it turns out that within half an hour after talking to his 15-year-old son, Talbert had a massive heart attack and died in a hotel room in Mississippi with a lit cigarette in his hand. The last conversation he ever had. So Talbert left behind three wives, seven kids. He was an alcoholic, like his own dad, and drank himself to death at 55, like his own dad. And Talbert Cooper Kelly begat Charles David Kelly, who begat Peter Charles Kelly. This is the family tree that I'm part of. This is my genealogy. This is part of my story. And Obviously, I would be a fool to believe that somehow my identity and my life would somehow be disconnected or unaffected by, these, by this story. But the truth is, yes, I am the beloved son of the Father in whom God is well pleased. And... I'm the son of Charles David Kelly, the son of Talbert Cooper Kelly, and so on. This just is who I am. And so I'll spare you all the details I'm discovering, all the ways that this story has shaped me and the implications, but what I will say is that for so many of us, We've been sold a gospel that somehow fails to acknowledge that our past has anything to do with our present. And some of us have a really messy and complicated and painful and traumatic family of origin, and some of us have a really great family. I have a great family. I have great parents. But all of us, in one way or another, are carrying wounds from our childhood. All of us are being shaped in ways we don't even know 
by our family of origin going back three to four generations. Sin is passed from generation to generation. And what happens is that in the process of calling us after himself, Jesus begins to carefully and gently help us identify the ways that our family has shaped us. And those wounds and those traumas and those messy stories and whatever else we would say about them become opportunities for his healing and his grace to begin to transform us. And so, my growing conviction is that discipleship is the process of learning to identify and put away the sinful patterns we've received from our family of origin and learning to live as part of the family of Jesus. And it doesn't happen instantaneously upon our conversion. It's a journey and it's a process. And as the psalm we read this morning declares, that it's initiated and led by a father who has compassion upon his children. And so the thing that I have had to wrestle with is that I have been ignorant of the fact that my present is shaped by my path, past. That in many ways, the gospel that I've received and the gospel that I've oftentimes proclaimed has failed to acknowledge this reality and has simply been content to tell the baptism story but then stop at verse 22 and not tell the genealogy story. Which why I think if we're honest, which is why I think if we're honest, the gospel for so many of us, we just want to call BS on it sometimes. It's a nice idea, but it just doesn't feel like it's actually got what it takes to really deal with real life with real people in the real world. I love the baptism story, and I'm banking my life on it. But the man who is declared loved and accepted and well-pleasing to his father is the man who's part of this long, messy, human story in this jacked up family tree. And we're just afraid to go there. We settle for Christian cliches and feel good inspirational verses that put band-aids over gaping wounds in our souls. And we don't know how to name it. We don't know how to talk about it. I know I don't. And I don't know exactly what the path forward looks like for me or for you or for any of us. But I'm confident that Jesus is the one I want to follow. Because sometimes people say things like, And maybe even you're experiencing this right now. Maybe you're saying, Pete, we shouldn't dwell on the past. Right? We shouldn't get so caught up in our life before we became Christians or things that we couldn't control. Sometimes you hear people say, yeah, that's who I was before Christ or B.C. That was me, B.C. Right? But that's not who I am anymore. And so we think that Christians are rededicated Christians. All the old stuff, our old life, our old story doesn't matter anymore. We have a new story now. Is that true? Kind of. 
We do have a new story. We do have a new identity. But it's rooted in the story that God's been writing in us the whole time. We can talk about our life BC, but the truth is there is no BC. He has existed for all eternity. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He did that for me and for my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents. He knew that this is how my story was going to go. It's not like Jesus just showed up in my life the day I raised my hand and prayed a prayer. It's that he was present in my story from the very beginning, in the good, in the bad, in the messy, in the horrible. How have we truncated the gospel down to something that has absolutely nothing to say to our family of origin, to our faith formation, to the life and, and the legacy that we've received for better or worse? If Jesus really is Lord of all, then it actually opens up this whole new world that is fertile soil for his transformation and for his redemption. And so the Pete Kelly that God says is dearly loved and pleasing to him, that's that's this guy. Not some sanitized, fairy tale, happy ever after, version of me, me here today, with my story and my mess and my depression and my doubt and everything else, with all my baggage, this whole story becomes an opportunity for the transforming work of Jesus to happen. Man, it would be fun to get up here and tell you all this as a finished product. (laughs) Having it all figured out. A success story. I'm very much in the middle of this process myself. And it's not fun. And it's not pleasant. And it's not enjoyable. And I'd rather not, if I'm honest. The way of Jesus has always been the way of the cross. To follow after him has always been to take up the cross. To go places we'd rather not go. It's a way marked by suffering. By patient endurance by faithful allegiance and a loving trust. Which is why I'm so grateful that we're not in this alone, that we have a new family. That we have brothers and sisters that are in process as well. And that we're cultivating an environment where we can talk about these kinds of things where we're allowed to pay attention to the dark and messy and hurtful and messed up places within our life and our story, within our past and within our present. The last thing the world needs is more BS Christians. I don't know where you are in your journey today. But I know God is with you whether you feel him or not. And I know that if you sense the Spirit leading you to courageously begin to ask questions related to your family of origin or related to your past, that God is with you And it's scary and it's hard. And I don't know exactly where it goes for you.
but I believe that this is the journey of discipleship that Jesus invites us on. And I'm wondering if maybe the reason so many of us never truly experience resurrection is because we're too afraid to die in the first place. And so I want to ask you to ask God. We'll take a moment and just in silent prayer, come before your compassionate Heavenly Father, the one who's been with you, the one who holds your story and holds your life. And take a moment and ask God in your own words or in your own way, where in my life, my past, my family history, are you wanting to raise the dead? What part of my story is in need of attention and redemption? In what ways am I being affected and maybe even enslaved by the curse of generational sin? Father, show me what you want me to see. Give me the courage to follow Jesus to the cross. Lord, I'm so grateful for this family. I truly do love my brothers and sisters here. With the love of your spirit. And I'm grateful for your presence and your work in us and among us in ways we don't even know. And I'm grateful that you're not done with us yet. That in your love and your compassion, you continue to chase after us. And that you and you alone are the ones that can heal our broken hearts. And we acknowledge, Lord, many of us don't feel you. We don't sense you. We don't know where you are or if you are. And yet we continue to call upon your name and trust in you and you alone. So give us courage, Lord. To go where you're leading. And we're inviting a deep move of your spirit in this season in our lives to make us whole. Give us the fruit of your spirit that we call patience or long-suffering. And don't let us give in to the temptation to put a pretty bow on any of this, but rather that we may endure and carry these crosses and somehow meet you in the midst of it all. You are our Father. In Jesus' name.